All right, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome, let's talk about file system migrations and let's hope I can get through this on time. So give a brief overview of Livermore Computing. I think that'll help uh, later on in the talk, um, give a little background. Talk about why am I migrating of these file systems? What did we look at? You know, what options are out there? And ultimately, what did I do? So Livermore Computing, kind of a big center. We're spread across three different buildings, three different data centers. Uh, physical buildings. A look at our configuration management systems showed about, or actually over 260 different unique active systems, and over 240 of those were more than one node. So you can loosely call those clusters, but there's a lot of them out there, and those are computer infrastructure, whether production or, or test and development. It's quite a few. Our flagship building, which we call the TerraScale Simulation Facility, and which needs a new name now, <laughs> or a little past Terra, but. Um, we upgraded that to 85 megawatts in the last last year, uh, I think went online that new power, so it's got a lot there. And the idea there is to be able to support two exascale systems at the same time. We're spread across five different network enclaves, which, which we call centers. And four of those have, have luster. Well, I actually think the fifth one also does too, but nobody uses it. <laughs> and um, if you look here, those 240 clusters that I talked about, there's all, all sorts of sizes, right, from two nodes on up. But nine of the systems, which you can kind of see here in those colored bubbles, uh, rank in the top 500 and actually the top 300. And our flagship system, Sierra, which is down at number six right now, it uh, comes in at about 95 petaflops, our max uh, score. If you look in the background here, you'll see that kind of large shaded uh, circle. And that represents El Capitan, which starts delivery here in, in, in a few months or so. Uh, so that'll be, uh, expect to be expected to be more than two exaflops. All right, so lots of systems. You need lots of storage. We've got about 190 petabytes of GPFS, 100 petabytes of Luster, a bunch of NFS. Focus on Luster, of course, here. We've got seven production file systems. Production meaning 24-7 user support. And those are spread across four of those, those five centers. Right now, we have a mix of, of hardware, and that's kind of what I'll be talking about. And we, on the older hardware, we're running 2.12. The newer hardware has a newer version of the operating system. So we run TOS, which is TriLab operating system, which is based on RHEL. So um, the 2.12 systems are running TOS 3, which is based on RHEL 7. The newer one's TOS 4, which is based on RHEL 8. Thus, we need Luster 2.14 or better. And actually last fall, we started an effort to migrate everything to 215, but ran into severe issues with our LNET routers. So I had to pull back. We're still chasing that down. I think we mostly have it, have it down. Um, I think one of the main tickets left uh, to be resolved is this uh, 16244. But we're, uh, Olaf here, he, he just checked in some, some fixes, some patches that have, have done a lot to resolve those issues. So hopefully 215 is in the near future. If you look down to the bottom here, you'll see these are our unclassified production file systems. And you'll notice that utilization is, is fairly low, and that's for a number of reasons. Partly because some of these are, are newly brought online file systems that added a lot of capacity, but also our three-tier luster user quotas play a big part in, in keeping utilization down. So you may remember back in 19, I talked about how we changed our level of, of service on, on Luster from a purgeable scratch to, to using uh, user quotas with, well, to using user quotas, right? So, so gone were, were all purges, which users love, and the data is now considered persistent. Again, uh, this was well received. It's gone pretty well. You can see capacity is, is capacity utilization is low. Um, as a case in point, one of our largest uh, file systems, which was a CZ Luster 2 in that, in that table, before the transition, it had over 4 billion files, and now four and a half years later, it's still hovering right around uh, 1 billion. So the, it, the, the quotas work pretty well. However, it created a lot of future work for us, right? Now, instead of telling users, go ahead and migrate whatever you want, we don't care, now it's on us to migrate all user data on all the file systems. So a lot of that work and that, that future that we feared arrived in 2021 with new hardware. So let me take a little tangent here. Um, we'll talk about exciting world of contracts. So in LC, we tend to set up contract for large multi-year procurements. 
and we've been doing that with our, our Lustre storage hardware for, for quite a while. Our current contract, we call the ASP contract, which I'll talk about in the next slide, that was won by Supermicro in 2020. The contract before that was won in 2016 by Raid Inc. And there are you know, many generations before that as well. The contracts typically last about five years through which we're, you know, we're buying systems. Warranty is about five years from delivery and we'll run them until we're run out of spares or they're you know, too much of a pain to run. Sometimes we can skip a generation, this ASP system in the, in the middle there, its predecessor was from the generation before Raid Inc, but it, it, was, it was really solid. So you can see here, we, we've migrated uh, three systems so far, this ASP, Bow, and Racer there on the bottom, those are the new systems, still have several more to, to migrate. So ASP stands for Adaptable Storage Platforms. So this is current contract, and this differs from previous ones in, in a number of ways. I mentioned we signed the ASP contract in 2020, and that was actually earlier than I had needed or anticipated. And that's because another group in LC, the archive group running HPSS, their, their disk cache system was about seven to eight years old and, it, and running out of spares. So they're kind of in a dire need of, of new hardware. So we sat down and decided it makes sense to find a solution that works for everybody. And that was further refined to this idea of a modular storage where we've got these COTS parts, we assemble those into, into predefined modules, and then we can mix and match those to get the system we need, whether capacity or performance, you know, what have you. We've also got modules for, for management infrastructure and, and a number of other options for fine tuning. So the idea here, let's say you want MDTs, right? Well, throw in FBBs. FBB is servers and NVMe flash. A DBB is an FBB with JBODs attached to it. So you can mix and match these as you see fit. And we've applied these to all sorts of applications. You can see on the upper right here, some, some of the applications we, we use the storage for. And, and we've procured now about 24 systems on this contract since, since 2020, so it's, it's well used. Now, of those 24 systems, that means we can share the inventory, the spares cache, all that across all those systems. So that's a big efficiency win as far as, as, as inventory. Additionally, we, we've got different teams using the ASP storage across multiple teams within groups and multiple groups. So we've got a, a much broader group of, of staff that now can all be, be trained or, or knowledgeable about the ASP hardware. That means they can help support it help explore new, you know, new things to discover about it. And we can eat a lot more easily share, share our, our knowledge. So that's another big win. We have a vendor support team we meet with regularly and we can cover all, you know, any issue across all these systems, as well as some compute systems we have from Supermicro. So another win. And finally, I'll mention that having all these systems be able to go through one single contract, uh, clears out a lot of the bureaucracy. So it's a much smoother process also saves us money. So again, lots of, lots of wins. And regardless of the vendor, I think in the future we'll probably continue this, this concept. All right, so we know we need to migrate these, these old luster clusters, right? So, so how do we do that? Well, set up some, some guidelines, kind of soft requirements on what it is we were looking for. Now, we tend to run our luster systems with one target per node, one MDT or one OST per node. And there's you know, lots of reasons for or maybe against that, but that's the way we like it. And uh, so we needed a solution that didn't depend on the destination file system having the same number of targets or nodes as, as the source. We use DNE2 fairly heavily, where we have thousands of user directories at the root level of the, of the file system. And so we need those, those balanced across MDTs. We wanted to be able to do a sync in a timely fashion, right, on the order of days, not weeks or months. And because I've been bitten by this in the past, I wanted to make sure that the data on the destination was the same as what's on the source. This is no longer scratch data that can easily be you know, regenerated, right? This is, this is considered persistent data. So we need to make sure that, that we had consistent data. All right, so let's iterate through some of these, these um, strategies here. So I think everyone knows we're a pretty big ZFS shop. ZFS has a cool feature called send receive basic idea here is you have a data set you can stream it over the network and receive it on on a remote node in, into a, into a pool 
So let's, let's walk through an example real quick here. So we've got this test cluster Zwicky, and, and this is a little bit uh, old example, so you'll see an old date stamp. But um, you know, thanks to Ula for, for this, this data. And uh, so we, let's go to Zwicky 17. That's going to be the destination node. And so we create a, a new fresh Z pool there. It's empty. And go to the source uh, node, Zwicky 3. We'll take the OST there. And we're going to take a snapshot, which are instantaneous in, in ZFS. And we'll send that with ZFS send along with extended attributes, which that gives you the luster information over the network, bring it in on Zwicky 17 into a new, new ZFS data set, which we call Z3 OST1. Once you send that off, you can monitor, you can see that it's growing and, and finishes, you verify that the data set is the same size as what was on the source. So send receive has good performance, especially you can you can do multiple streams at once with, with multiple data sets. So like it says here, we, we got an aggregate of about 32 terabytes per hour over a QDR fabric. You can do incremental updates. However, a drawback is you're gonna end up with the same number of, of targets on the destination as you had on the source. And in, in our first migration, we're going from 80, that's an eight zero OSDs down to just eight. And so you could, after the fact, do local migration, say with LFS migrate to coalesce those down to one, but that's a lot of extra work and time. So we decided not to go this route. I mentioned LFS migrate, right? So that, that's another option. We've played with this in the past. We've had issues in the past. We think those were all resolved by 212 timeframe, but we, we set up a test. We, we created uh, pools of, of what we call old disks and, and new disks and tried migrating those with LFS migrate both running it straight on you know, file system tree as well as using LFS find to pipe files to LFS migrate. And ultimately the, the performance in either manner was disappointing to the point where it wouldn't really be feasible in our, in our eyes to, to continue that, that method. Um, some other issues, there's complexities in migrating MDT zero and uh, a big one you'd need to co-locate the, the cluster sufficiently so that you could bring them into the same file system. And that could be difficult for us, just given physical distances in, in the data center. You'd have to do some pretty long cable runs. So we decided not to go this route. Uh, file level redundancy, newish feature. So main, main idea here, set up two, two groups of pools, old disks, new disks, bring those into the same file system, then you create a replica of you know, across those, those two pools. Any new file will automatically go to both sides of that mirror, but all existing files, of which we had billions, right, those have to be explicitly extended and, and, and replicated. So that's a, a fair bit of work to extend all those, those files. Another big, big con for us was this would also require having the same number of targets on the destination as on the source which is something we wanted to get away with or, and get away from, I should say. And it was, it was somewhat labor intensive, right? Grouping all those, doing the manual extensions, then, then breaking the, the, the mirrors and removing all those, all those older targets. So keep going. So we looked at some open source and commercial solutions. Um, so I think Stefan talked about MigrateFS in, in 2019. And if I, if I remember it right, the data is either purged or kind of migrates itself. As it's read and rewritten, it writes itself using OverlayFS to, to the new media. But with our persistent files, where we're not necessarily reading that anytime soon and we're not purging, that approach isn't going to work for us. In Lab 2016, there's a talk on this LFS, or this, sorry, Luster migration tool. I couldn't find it anywhere. So skip that. Hard drive swaps. We didn't really seriously consider that here. We, we, we've done that before to move an MDT this years ago from spinning hard drives to SSDs. But for this, it would be too, too slow, right? We've got nearly 10,000 hard drives to go through. So move on to commercial. So the uh, French company, Atempo, they have a product called Miria that supports Lustre migration. It uses control and multiple agent nodes, can do parallel transfers. It reads the Lustre change log. Talked with them a couple of times. At the time, they did not support DNE with multiple MDTs, so that, that's a problem. They had a serial FS scan, the, the walking, that would be a problem for us with you know billions of files. 
and they essentially require that your destination looks just like your your source cluster. So moving on, looked at, at Starfish, and I'll give a little credit to Justin Wood from Sandia here who introduced me to this specific tool. We've actually been a Starfish customer for, for quite a while. We, we like them, it's a good team. Um, unfortunately, it, when we went, when we were looking into this, our implementation of Starfish was on some pretty old or insufficient <laughs> hardware. So we were severely lacking in capacity and bandwidth at the time. And so we, we felt this wouldn't be a, a, a really usable or very good solution at the time, perhaps in the future. All right, so after months of finding something that wasn't satisfactory, I started writing my own solution. It needs a better name, but for now it's called Luster FS Sync. <laughs> and on the left here, you can see kind of some of the requirements on the right. What, what the script does or how it deals with it. You know, I've mentioned we, we don't want to need the same number of targets on the destination as on the source. So this doesn't care at all about that. We want to make sure that our user directories are, are balanced across the MDTs and FS Sync will auto detect the MDTs, pull in the, the inode capacity usages and, and balance, balance those inodes at least. We want a timely comp completion. So the uh, or FS Sync uses the MPI file utils and specifically the desync utility, which gives pretty good performance. We want to be able to do data integrity checking again to to make sure that the destination equals the source, and you can do that here if you want. We needed PFL and DOM, and that's that's pretty trivial, right? Just need to make sure that it's done before you copy the data, and wanted something that's not labor intensive, and that's that's pretty vague. I ended up spending a lot of time micromanaging the processes. I didn't need to. I mean, I saved minutes of time probably for hours, you know, days of, of effort. <laughs> but um, you can, you know, essentially run a migration with one command. Okay, so here's what the script looks like. Uh, you can see in yellow, essentially all you really need is a source and a destination as, as arguments. But all these other options exist because at some point I felt I needed them, so I made them. I would highly, highly recommend using the dash B option for batch size. So desync by default has an unlimited batch size. And what that means is it will, well, the way desync works is it will copy all the data and only after that, that batch of data has been copied, then it updates the metadata. So if there's, you know, if it aborts early, you don't get the ownership permissions or any of that on, on your data, which is a problem, right? And again, with desync, if it has an in, in incom incomplete or incomplete batch, when you run it again, it'll have to go through and remove all the data from the unfinished uh, previous sync and start over. So not good if you're doing a whole file system. But with a batch size, you can you know give it a, whatever batch size you feel appropriate, maybe little files, you know maybe 250,000 for a batch size, really big files, maybe 20 or, or 50 files, it's up to you. So it'll go copy over that data, then update the metadata. Lots of other options here. And um, as far as dependencies, so MPR file utils, you'll want to get the latest version of that. This 0.11.1 actually has some, some fixes that I needed when I, that we coded, that, well, that Adam Moody and the MFU, the MFU team added to, to help this go more smoothly. It needs user, user quotas enabled. They don't have to be enforcing, but need to be enabled. And it's set up to use Slurm. You could probably change that if you needed to. I've been trying to get this pushed through for release from the lab, and it's mostly approved, but not 100%. Once that is, then I plan on putting it into our Luster Tools Linel package, which we've got up on GitHub. And that also uh, includes LTOP and some other uh, utilities. So the general process flow, um, it'll go through, set, out the, set up the layout, then it'll look for the heaviest users. And that's either inode or capacity if you give it that option. And capacity matters because you don't want to make, well, you don't want heavy capacity users being submitted for sync at the very end, right? Because they're gonna take a long time. So what this does is, is it will prioritize the submission of, of those heavy capacity users. So once it creates all those, those user directories, well, first it'll do the heavy users, Bounce those, then it'll 
finish kind of round robber, robbing, robining, what's, what's the verb there? Um, doing a round of robin across all the remaining users and, and set th so those user directories up. Then the script will sit there and, and spin and wait for room in the, in, the, in the Slurm queue to submit more jobs. There's a dash capital C option to do a byte level comparison between all the data. As you can imagine, that takes a long time. I felt I, I needed it, needed to do that at some point in order to make sure that my data was consistent. I was probably a little paranoid. And I kind of regretted doing, it's fine doing an incremental sync, doing it for a final sync, I would not recommend because it can take a long time. And we did a test following a, one of our syncs to see if we could induce an error into, or induce a change into a file and then have the default desync algorithms not pick up that change. And we, we couldn't, which means the desync default algorithms are just fine to basically capture any change. So following that test, we're only doing the, at least for the final syncs, we're only doing the, the default desync, not the byte level comparison. Okay, then to do the final sync, we just put the source file system read only, do a sync, which we could get down to half a day in, in some cases, and then, then swap the mounts. Let's go through a brief example. This was our RZ Luster one file system. It's a little bit smaller, but heavily used. You can see we doubled the number of, of MDTs, increased OST slightly, and more than doubled the capacity of the file system. So we'll, we'll walk through this. So here's essentially the command that we, we ran. The dash M option, that, stand, that tells you the max number of jobs in the, in the Slurm queue. You want to give it enough to keep it busy, but not too many that it just kind of overwhelms the, you know, the, the printout of the queue, just for, you know, keep it nice. The dash N is the number of CPUs per job, per, per normal size job. The FS Sync has normal jobs and large jobs, and it'll automatically double the CPU count for large jobs. And so this, this aligned, I think, with the number of CPUs across two nodes, so it's basically a, a two node job. So you can see it goes through here, it, it pulls in the usages of, of users, it sets the DOM and PFL layout, then it'll go through and, and balance those user directories across MDTs. You can see here around over 2,100 users. It did a pretty good job, I think, of, of balancing the number of inodes. Then it'll go through and sit there and, and submit jobs until all the jobs in the queue are, are finished. So fast forward to the final sync, pretty much the same command. There's a dash capital D option here, which says delete data, delete files on the destination that no longer exists on the source. So basically, you know, just keep it, you know, try to keep it consistent. And we increased number of inodes here, but still pretty, pretty decent job balancing. And this run, the, la the first run took a little under a week. This run took a little under a day. As I mentioned, we had uh, another one took less than half a day for an incremental sync. So all, this, all these syncs um, taught us some things. So one is that the bandwidth on your Elnet routers, if you're using them, can matter. So we remember, we have multiple buildings, and so in, and for some of these, our client cluster was in a different building from the, the Lustre clusters. And that actually created a, quite a bottleneck that, that we tried to mitigate later by trying to use com compute resources in the, in the same building. So be, be aware of, of your router bandwidth. Large users. So we did lots of incremental syncs before the final sync, but in one case, in the two to three days between the last incremental sync and the final sync, we had a user drop 72 terabytes of data into their directory. And they were, their job was submitted later in the process. And so we were coming up to the, the, the deadline for the scheduled downtime of the switchover. And this user still had a whole bunch more data to go. So it'd be hard for, to prepare for situations like that, but we ended up canceling those long running user jobs going ahead with the transitions, swapping the mount points, resubmitting those long running user jobs, and just personally contacting the user and saying, hey, you know, don't touch the file system until your job is finished, and, and that worked fine. So you can run FS Sync with, you know, like, you know, like you saw, one command, but I would recommend monitoring it. Jobs fail, we all know that, for, for numerous reasons. So you wanna make sure that you, you keep those jobs moving if there you know, is a job that is stalled or, or failed. 
I talked about this. You really don't need on your final sync the, the dash capital C, that long byte level comparison. The, the default algorithms are sufficient. And ultimately, big data takes big time, right? It's, it's just, you gotta, there's no way around it. Gotta be patient. So, thank you. Open for questions. Can you hear me? I can hear you. <clears throat> what, uh, are you guys using InfiniBand as your protocol for your storage network? Yeah, yeah, we have a we have a storage uh, SAN basically an IB SAN in, in each of our buildings. Um, individual compute clusters use different. They, some of them use OmniPath, um, some InfiniBand, but the luster clusters are have InfiniBand on the back end. Are you going to be using a slingshot with your new environment? Yes. So our our new. Uh, you know, Cray systems is part of our the Coral contract, El Capitan, and the early access systems go with that. They are using Slingshot. Um, they'll ultimately go through routers to, if they want to communicate outside, you know, InfiniBand routers, but inside they are Slingshot. I'd like to thank you very much, Cameron Hall. That was wonderful. Thank you.